I learned to ski. Yeah, but this, we haven't seen anything. We cleaned up all the poop. I just, I'm trying to mute people as fast as I can. That's all right. We can wait a bit here. Get that all set up. I think it's good now. Good now. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, both Sally and I learned to ski in Michigan. Uh, we grew up in Ann Arbor where we were high school sweethearts. And we just went to different colleges together. But uh, back in Michigan, there was a nearby hill called Mount Brighton that had 100 vertical feet and two chairlifts. And that's where we started alpine skiing. And then we skied some more in upper Michigan and Sal went to school in the east. And so during college, they had those great student standby flights. I don't know if y'all remember that or not, but I could fly from Detroit to Boston for 20 bucks. And I, I'd fly to Boston and meet Sal and we'd drive to Vermont and ski in some of those alpine areas. So we were downhill skiers. And when I graduated from college, we got married and we flipped a coin. Should we go east or west to find better skiing? And we decided to go west and ended up in Seattle where I taught school and Sal went back to school, got a second degree in forestry and also taught in Seattle. Then we moved to the Metal. But before we moved to the Metal, and I'll talk about this in the slideshow, um, we discovered cross-country skiing. Um, and the rest is, is really the story that I'm going to talk about now. And I have to be really clear on this. This history of the Metal skiing really is more my history and my perspective. And part of that, of course, is the pictures that I have are the ones that I took. So I don't have a lot of other people. So um, I think we can get this going if I can do all of the things correctly. We can get there. And I'm gonna hit this, it'll take a moment for this to come on and we'll make it full size. Well, <clears throat> the real truth is that these are my sisters and they all taught me to ski way back when. But the truth is well before we got to the Metal, there was a lot of skiing going on here. In fact, in the thirties, there was a high school ski team. And even back in the thirties, people would come to the Metal Valley to ski, especially from Wenatchee. And some of the lowland hills here were the scenes of some races back in the 30s. Of course, in those days, there was just skiing. There wasn't cross country skiing, downhill skiing, there was just skiing. And those of you that have skied Powers Plunge and seen the old cabin there, that was the cabin's, the cabin was the Powers homestead. And after the Powers left, the cabin was the clubhouse for the Metal Ski Club. And on the hill behind that, they actually had a jumping hill. Well, when the World War II came, that call all sort of ended and it took a while for skiing to rebuild, except in the 60s when the Loop Loop Downhill area was built and alpine skiing started to happen there, of course. Well, <clears throat> for the skiing as we know it today, really the start of all that was with this guy. And most of you know him, Dave Chandler. He was the ski buyer for REI and the bicycle buyer. And he, of course, was very interested in the Metal and was very interested in doing a bunch of mountain bike stuff here as well. And that's why that particular picture. But the thing about Dave Chandler is that he was really key to me and Sally for what we do here in the Metal Valley. Dave Excuse Chandler, me, Don. We are only seeing your all your photos together. We're not seeing just oh, really? one photo right. at a time. I think we can fix that. Um, I mean, okay, so time. we're going to listen to this. So if you guys want to talk, should we go, go to another place? Or yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> okay, now what have you got? Okay, that looks great. We see some beautiful ladies skiing along, drawing, looks like. Okay, we're good. There we go. Now we get Dave? Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Perfect. So uh, while Sal and I were living in, in Seattle, we were downhill skiers and we'd go to places like Crystal Mountain and and Alpental in those places, and we're having a wonderful time. But in the early 70s, we saw an ad in the paper where REI was going to offer free cross-country lessons um, up at near Stampede Pass. So we drove up there, we rented some wooden skis in Seattle, and the instructor was Dave Chandler. And it just so happened that it was a beautiful day up there with blue wax conditions, which is pretty unusual near Snoqualmie Pass. And we went with Dave and he sort of taught us about cross country skiing or a little bit. And we absolutely loved it, of course. It was just the greatest thing. 
to get these skis that you didn't have to take a lift and you didn't have to follow the runs. You could go wherever you wanted on the snow. And so we immediately bought a set of cross country skis for $72 at REI that includes skis, boots, poles, and a little wax kit. <clears throat> and you can see the skis that we had here, the leather boots, the Trondor wooden skis on our bamboo poles. Well, <clears throat> we assumed of course that cross country skis meant going cross country. So we took our skis and we went everywhere. We did overnight trips, um, ski wherever we could find snow. This particular picture was taken, taken up near Table Mountain near Blewett Pass, and that's Mount Stewart in the background. And we've discovered this whole new world of cross-country skiing. Well, at the same time, we were getting tired of the city in Seattle. We were tired of the rain. We grew up in a climate that had four seasons. And <clears throat> at that time in the early 70s, there was a huge back to the land movement. And we decided that we wanted to be hippies in the hills and we were looking for cheap property. And believe it or not, back in 1972, property in the Metau Valley was cheap. And we bought 40 acres up what's called Elbow Canyon, and not Elbow Cooley, but Elbow Canyon, and it's sort of down below Lookout Mountain. And we built a little cabin there and would come over from Seattle the first few years and just ski around our cabin. And this is a hill just above that cabin. And once again, we grew up as downhill skiers. So on our cross-country skis, we'd never heard of Telemark. We just skied them like our alpine skis and found that we could do it if we were very carefully balanced. We could make good tracks if the snow was right and had a blast skiing around our cabin. In 1976, North Cascade Highway opened and we were able to expand some of that touring up into the high mountains. This is up near early winter spire uh, in the springtime. But we were trying to figure out how to get to the Metau Valley permanently. And once again, Dave Chandler stepped in to kind of save the day for us. Because what happened is Sun Mountain Lodge and Jack Barron, the owner and builder of Sun Mountain Lodge, decided that he wanted to have a winter cross country program. And so he called Jim Whitaker at REI and said, would you advise us on that? And so Jim Whitaker turned that over to Dave Chandler, the ski buyer, and said, Dave, look into this. And so Dave drove to the Metau Valley with some friends and they stayed at Sun Mountain and they skied around the area and had a blast. They hit good weather, good snow. And so Chandler decided that, yes, yeah, Sun Mountain would work as a place for a cross country area. And so Sun Mountain slowly began to do a little bit of grooming and a little bit of signage. A guy named Terry Haynes, who moved to the Metau, hoping to get in on the ground floor for the Aspen Corporation ran the program for the very first season. And he really, his heart wasn't really into cross-country skiing and the program really wasn't going anywhere. Um, so Chandler suggested to Jack Barron that he hire someone who was a professional. <clears throat> well, even though I first learned to cross-country ski in the early, early 70s, like 71 or something like that, by 1975, I was already a fully certified instructor and therefore a qualified professional. And I had applied to Sun Mountain for a job as a cross country ski instructor. So Jack Barron hired me. Well, luckily that very same year, the Seattle school levy failed and I lost my teaching job. So it was a perfect opportunity to move to the Metau and start the cross country ski program at Sun Mountain. However, 1976 was the only year that the North Cascade Highway was open all year long and there was no snow in the Metau. But we saved the day because once again, Dave Chandler had organized bus trips from REI in Seattle to Sun Mountain Lodge. And we were able to talk the bus driver into driving us up to Washington Pass so we could all tour around the pass. And we would take people into Cutthroat Lake and the meadows around Washington Pass. And this picture was taken uh, in December or January of that year when there was no snow in the valley, but we managed to scrape together a successful ski program anyway. Well, <clears throat> as things began to progress and we began to develop the trails at Sun Mountain and we did get snow, things began to change in the cross country world. Telemark skiing became well known. Here's a picture of Libby Hillis, so I'm sure you all know. Uh, telemarking off one of the little hills of Sun Mountain, noticed that she was wearing Carhu skate boots and probably skate skis at the time. 
But our hearts <clears throat> were always into touring, on track, off track, every place we could go. And in those days, of course, as we were much younger and stronger, we would ski up the Groom Trail up Thompson Ridge Road to the top. And then we would leave the trail and go up what we called Soaring Hawk, which is, this is a picture on the way up Soaring Hawk, which is one of the, the sub peaks in that area. And after getting to the top, we would just telemark down and very often we would ski through what is now Pine Forest development. And it's kind of interesting because when I would groom up there and it was my job to do the grooming at Sun Mountain, I would groom a trail called Diving Hawk which went from Meadowlark down all the way to Elbow Cooley and went all the way through Elbow Cooley, through the ponds, back up to the bottom of Pine Forest and then up Raider Creek and join the rest of the trail system. Now that trail was groomed consistently, but never ever skied. In fact, I'd often go back there to groom it again and notice that no one had been on it. And one of the great story about that, in the early days, a young guy named Tom Baker worked for me as an instructor and a groomer. And he came in one day, all long faced and sad, Tom, what's the matter? And he said, I sunk the snowmobile. And he'd been grooming across one of the little ponds in Elbow Cooley and broke through the ice and sunk the snowmobile in the pond. And they went down to look at it. And sure enough, you could see just the handlebar sticking up out of the water. But we managed to tie a rope onto it and pull it out. Anyway, we, of course, long ago gave up grooming in Elbow Cooley. Well, as the seasons would progress, we didn't want to quit skiing. So, of course, when the Hearts Pass Road opened up, we would drive to Hearts Pass and ski there. Um, and for those of you that know him, this is a picture of Jeff Childs and how he looked in the 70s. Okay. Well, as I said, telemarking was becoming a big deal. Steve Barnett had written his book, Cross Country Downhill. Rick Borkovic in Colorado had sparked interest in that. And also at the time, Liberty Val Alpine Tours was operating, operated by Eric Sanford. And we decided at Liberty Bell that we should offer a telemark camp in the what we called the Mizano camp every May. And we did, and people would come from all over the country and spend uh, a number of days at the Mizano camp. We could always depend on the North Cascade Highway opening in mid-April, uh, to get ready for fishing season in this side of the mountains. And then we knew we had access to snow by early May when we held these telemark camps. And often we would finish the camp with an overnight and this is uh, uh, up Copper Creek and that's Stiletto Peak in the background. And just a note here, you see a gentleman by two black packs there without a shirt. That of course is Eric Burr who felt that he needed to take a bath daily and found an open water creek that he jumped in. He wasn't joined by anyone else. Well, <clears throat> as I said earlier, telemarking was becoming a big deal. We were interested in skiing the backcountry. So every now and then I would borrow a snowmobile from Sun Mountain and we would take the snowmobile up the Hearts Pass Road. And this is a picture of skiing the backside of Slate Peak uh, one February um, where we, skied a bunch and then of course had to return to town or return the snowmobile. Same place, same shot at Sal. Well, also in those days, they kept the North Cascade Highway open later into the fall, usually well into November. And usually there was plenty of snow. This of course is towards Maple Pass with Lake Ann in the background. And it's a picture of Dale Caulfield. And, um, the important thing about Dale to note is that even though Enoch Kraft was the very beginning of the huts in the rendezvous, it was really Dale and Steve Farmer that made the huts what they are today. They're the ones that really put it together. Um, and we skied together quite a bit. In fact, uh, we'll talk about the birthday tour later. In fact, here's a picture of Brett Allenbaugh who now runs the Metal, or the, sorry, the Sun Mountain Ski School after I retired as part of the birthday tour. And the birthday tour was not on Sally's birthday, but it was my birthday in May. And the original party was me, Dale Caulfield, and Jill Sabella, who at that time lived in the Valley as a photographer. Well, <clears throat> I think most of you in the Meta are familiar with these characters, of course, Eric Burr on the left. And Eric came to the Meta to help us teach at the Mazama camp. And of course, like the area, 
And he was the first one to be a professional ski patrol at a downhill ski area on cross-country skis. He also skied exclusively in the, in the Olympic mountains in the wintertime on cross-country skis, and then later became a backcountry ranger in North Cascade National Park. And of course, the person on the right is Steve Barnett. He's holding snake skins. If any of you ever used those until they broke, were, were pretty useful for the skinny skis that we had. And just a side note about Steve Burnett, uh, Barnett, if any of you notice in the Mazama area, there's a road just past Jay's house that says Graceland. And that has nothing to do with Elvis. Steve's wife, Grace Cisneros, was what that road was named after. Anyway, Steve and Eric and I would ski all around the Metal Valley and the high mountains in the springtime whenever we could get access. And in those days, usually we were the only ones there, not like today when there are cars lining both sides of the highway. And Steve was great at finding places to go because he would keep track of where winter logging was going on. And so very often we could get up someplace where you couldn't normally get because the road was plowed due to logging. Well, Steve, of course, was famous for the telemark. And this is his classic telemark with, a, with the inside hand held high. And um, Eric, on the other hand, is well known for what most of us call the burr turn, which essentially is an open turn. If you look at the tips of his skis, you see that they are splayed slightly. And he's using the inside ski to help pull him into the turn. And it turns out it's a very, very effective turn on cross-country skis in all kinds of snow conditions. And this is an unusual picture. This is one fall up at Slate Peak where Eric Burr and I went to ski. And here's the case where Eric almost fell. Uh, this guy, his balance is so great. He would always practice on a slack line between two trees, so his balance was good. Uh, I never see Eric fall. Of course, Eric is also willing to ski anywhere any terrain. Well, as you all know, as things progressed, backcountry skiing went away from cross-country skis and moved towards alpine touring, as we see today. Now, of course, the biggest and most expensive piece of equipment for alpine tours is their snowmobile, so they can get access to the high stuff. But of course, with plastic boots, big skis, and skins, but everybody has the same goal. We all want the same thing. We want to get up into the big mountains. We also want to get up where the snow is great and the powder is good, where we can make some turns. Well, you're all familiar with the ski wars that went on in the Metal Valley in the late 70s when the Aspen Corporation wanted to build the big ski area on Sandy Butte. Well, there was a minor ski war going on at the same time. And this guy, Eric Sanford, who came here in the late 70s and started Liberty Bell Alpine Tours, decided that helicopter skiing would be a good addition to that. Well, also another resident here, Dave Kazak, had the same idea and also wanted to have helicopter skiing. The trouble was these two guys didn't really get along. So we had two competitors each trying to vie for the single permit that the Forest Service would allow for helicopter skiing in the Cascades. Well, Kazak started out by hiring this helicopter. Luckily, I was friends with both of them and actually a guide with Eric at Liberty Bell. But with KZAC, we took this up into the Sawtooths and we thought we would go up there and explore the Sawtooths and see what that terrain was like uh, for heli skiing, thinking that maybe Sun Mountain would be a good base and not too long a flight time to get there. So we went up with Scott Demurg on the left, Dave KZAC with the red bandana, Lee Miller with the pink bandana and Gary Phillips on the right wearing the dark coat. And getting up in the Sawtooths in the middle of the winter was really fun. It was kind of cool to camp there and beautiful scenery, really some spectacular terrain. But what I found out most of the time, the Sawtooths get less snow than the central range of the Cascades and more wind. And the ski conditions very often up there are not the best in the world. Now, as it turns out, Eric won the permit from the Forest Service to start heli skiing. And just before we go with that, just a quick side note um, back on the Sawtooths. Once we were heli skiing with Liberty Bell Alpine Tours, the forest supervisor, Bill McLaughlin of the Okanagan National Forest, 
wanted us to fly and heli ski in the sawtooth because he wanted to establish motorized use. He didn't want the sawtooth to become a wilderness. So we didn't want it to uh, become motorized. We were all for having it be a wilderness, but we had to go fly there at least once. So we went to the sawtooth one time, we skied around, we had a nice time, but then we called him up and said, gee, Bill, it just doesn't work. If the snow's bad, we just can't do it. So luckily he gave up on that idea and the Sawtooth Lake Chelan area did become a wilderness. Anyway, because we got to do that, we got to fly up in a helicopter into the North Cascades, into this incredible terrain. And I got to ski the very, very steep. I got to ski the deep. We got to make tracks in all these beautiful places. It was just so much fun. But I have to say that we were Nordic skiers at heart. And so very often we would go out to do some exploring before we took clients there to see what a certain run would be like and what the landings were like. And when we did that, we always took our cross country skis. So if you look very carefully in this picture, just below the basket of the ski pole, you can see two little ski tips sticking up in the snow because those were cross country skis that I was using. Well, at about that time, Eric would go off to Las Vegas every year to the annual ski show and try and drum up sponsors for heli skiing and the other activities that we were doing. At the same time, the Metal Valley Family Sports Club, which started with the very, very beginning of Metal Trails, was a group of people that were interested in cross country skiing and soccer. And that's why it was called the Family Sports Club. It very quickly morphed into Metal Valley Ski Touring Association or MVSTA. And at that time we were trying to figure out how to make a nonprofit work for a cross country ski area. So we hired Tom Perkins and he's the guy in the yellow jacket there to come back from New England and he ran Jackson Ski Touring Foundation at the time. So he came here to advise us on setting up the nonprofit of MVSTA. Well, while Eric Sanford was gone in Las Vegas, I thought, hey, He's gone. The helicopter's here. Let's make use of it. Let's see if we can do a tour with the helicopter. So we had the helicopter fly from Mazama up to the top here of what we used to call whoop de doo which is up near Setting Sun Peak up behind Mazama, dropped us off here. And of course, Tom in the yellow, I'm in the blue with the red pants, Sal, of course, in the red jacket, and Steve Farmer on the right. And those of you that didn't know Steve, he with Dale really worked to get the Rendezvous Hut's going, and he was an amazing guy. He was so big and so strong, happy all the time, a little bit of a loose cannon, but kind of fun. And if he was out grooming and the snowmobile stuck, it was never a problem because he could pick it up with one hand and put it right back on the track. Anyway, we got to the top and we had the rest of the day to ski back down to Mazama. That's Sal skiing there. We had great snow, great fun. Steve, well, he, his experience was a little different. And I have to say that although he was a lot of fun to be with, he was sort of a traveling wreck. And on that day, he broke a pole, a ski, a binding, and I'm not sure what else he broke. <laughs> so that was established. We now had what we called the super tour, which every morning we would take a first group of skiers up to the top of, actually behind Go Peak and drop them off. And they would spend the day skiing back to Mazama. And then they would take the downhill skiers with the helicopter up, usually at the Silver Star area, which is in the background. The guy in the yellow, of course, is Brian Charlton, the manager of Sundown Lodge. So this is where we would land behind Goat Peak for these people to start their tour. Well, in those early days, getting back to Sun Mountain and what we were doing, I was doing all of the grooming with the snowmobile. And this is what we considered to be excellently groomed trails in those days. And that's about as good as we could do with a snowmobile and a little molder. Um, as I said, the first year we didn't have any snow. The second year we had a lot of snow, but we needed to figure out how to work it. So Sun Mountain had an old Yamaha snowmobile that really wasn't up to the task. But Jack Barron didn't give me much of a budget for equipment. So I found these two Valmonts used for sale over near Tenasca. I went and bought them and brought them back to Sun Mountain. And that's what we used for grooming for quite a few years. The problem was that they were so old that they broke down all the time. And so what I would do 
is I would go out and groom usually very early in the morning. And if the snowmobile broke down, which was common, I'd get the other one. I'd tow the broken one back on this little sled I had, change my clothes into ski instructor clothes, teach lessons, rent skis. And then after everything was done for the day, I'd go in the garage and try and rebuild the broken snowmobile so I could start the process all over again. Well, notice that the snowmobile in the back doesn't have a windshield. And what happened with snowmobiles in those days very often is if you got off the pack surface when you were trying to groom new snow, the snowmobile would slide sideways and get stuck. Well, after the fifth or sixth time of getting stuck on Little Wolf at Sun Mountain, I took that snow shovel and I started beating that snowmobile and yelling and cursing at it at the top of my lungs in the middle of the night. And that's what happened to the windshield on that snowmobile. Well, <clears throat> I also discovered that first year we had no snow and the second year when we did that I needed to mow the trails before it snowed. And I didn't do that because I didn't know about that yet. So I built this machine to go out and try and mow the trails after it snowed. Um, OSHA didn't approve it and we kind of gave up with that. And nowadays, of course, Metau Trail spends a lot of time and effort in summer preparation so that this kind of thing doesn't have to happen. Well. In those days, I was working at Sun Mountain, and in Mazama, they were trying to get trails going. Dick and Sue Roberts were inter, uh, <clears throat> they were really involved in that, and so was Jay. And it's a picture of Jay doing some grooming near the ranch house with the old snowmobiles. And of course, MVSDA had our own little ski team and ran races. Jay, me, Sal, and Pat Stearns, who was also around at that time, and he now lives in the Sun Valley area. One thing to note here is the little blue dials on the skis that Pat and I are holding. And those were attached to little like wires that were inside the ski. So you would turn the knob if you wanted more camber one way or turn it the other way if you wanted the ski to flex a little bit softer. Well, <clears throat> didn't work. Funny idea, but it didn't work. So as things progressed, we realized that we needed to get tourists to come here and we needed to have some sort of publicity. So we began to produce maps and brochures and we would take pictures and find printers and, and get brochures made. And this was one picture that I took of Sal that we used on the cover of a brochure one year um, to promote skiing in the Metau Valley. Well, that summer we were in Spokane and noticed this on the side of Mountain Gear in downtown Spokane. Well, here's Jay. Looks the same now, I think. He certainly wears the same clothes. I um, have to say that Metau Trails, MVSTA, is where it is today because of Jay. Jay is the one that really had the vision. He's the one that could put together the finances, put together the things to make a lot of this stuff work. It was because of Jay that we could move towards getting piston bullies, and constantly improve what we were doing. I was just kind of limping along at Sun Mountain trying to figure out how to make stuff go without much money, or Jay was smarter and trying to figure out how to get more money so we can do things in a better way. So of course, because of his efforts, we could get the very first piston bully. This piston bully came as a result of a loan from Farmer's State Bank that was guaranteed by the Haubs, because by that time, Jack Barron had died and the Haubs had bought his estate and we're rebuilding Sun Mountain to what it is today. And of course, the Piston Bully changed everything. It was a, also coincided with the time that skate skiing came on. And so we needed to make all the trails wider. And so we went out with bulldozers. This is on a crisscross trail and, or overland, I'm sorry. And what I did then is I would hire my neighbor, Mel Northcott there to come out with his bulldozer and I would say, Mel, follow me. And I would just walk along the trail and he would follow me with the cat there, scraping away to make it the trail bigger and wider and whatever. Did I talk to the Forest Service about it? Heck no, I just went and did it. And in those days, you could kind of get away with that. We had a permit to have a ski area. So I figured, well, if we have that, we can, we can do things like that. And, and we did. So we made the trails bigger so that we could accommodate skating and, of course, the big snow cat. Well, it was important that we used little cats at that time because we were really concerned with what the ground would look like when summer came. 
So we always tried as much as we could to do the trail building in the fall. We want our trails to look like this. It's wide enough for a skate lane, a classic lane. This is Beaver Pond Trail in the summer. It was already a wagon road, so it already looked something like this. But we really wanted the trails to be like this as much as possible. We wanted them to look like a single track trail. So if we did the bulldozing in the fall, usually the plants would come back in the spring. So even though there's a platform there, hard to see, all the balls and root and stuff are back and we ended up with a single track trail. Well, at that time, I was lucky enough to be selected to the Professional Ski Instructors of America National Demonstration Team. And our job was to go around and teach other instructors how to teach. And part of the deal being on the demo team, besides doing that, was we got all this free stuff. I got free skis, boots, poles, and clothes. And at that time, Descent, Jan Japanese manufacturer, gave us all kinds of clothes. And every fall, I would get boxes of things. Also at that time, Lycra was in, and everybody felt they had to wear Lycra suits to go cross-country skiing. And that year, my Lycra suit, as you can see, was rather red. Well, we had just finished designing, building, and grooming rodeo for the very first time. In fact, it wasn't even named yet, but there it was. Uh, I designed it to be more exciting with lots of hills and turns, just like it is today. And we just groomed it for the first time, and I got a call on the radio. I think it was Wanda Myers was out there, and she said, hey, there's a cow wrecking the trail. So I grabbed my classic skis, and I zoomed out there, and I started skiing rodeo looking for where that cow might be. I got close to the Huff Homestead, and there was this pretty small animal. And so I thought, well, I'll just scare it out towards the road and then call Claude Miller, because he's the one that was running cows in that area in the summer, to pick it up. So I started shouting and yelling and waving my poles in my little red suit. And that cow put its head down, scuffed the snow with one foot, and rammed me, hit me right in the belly, knocked me down, broke the tips off of both skis and broke one of my poles, turned around and took off. And oh boy, I'm lucky to be alive, I thought, first and second is I got to get out of here. So I picked up my broken equipment, jogged out the trail. I called up Claude and said, hey, Claude, you got to come out here. We got a cow loose. We need you to get it out of there. Well, he showed up about a half an hour later with another cowboy, both of them on horses, of course, to start searching the trail system for this lost cow. Of course, I'm pulling my hair out because everything has just been groomed and we've got horses wandering all over the trails making a huge mess so I thought okay while they're doing that I better look too we got to find this critter so I grabbed my skate skis since my classic skis were broken took off started skating around and I was going part way up crisscross when I saw it standing in a little sunspot and so I whistled and yelled and said Claude Claude come on Claude I found it come on come on so Claude came up on his horse Rides up next to me. He looks down at this guy standing there in a little red pink uni suit, shakes his head and goes, you city boys, can't you tell that's a bull? So that's why we named it Rodeo after my bull riding experience. Well, at that time, all the trails now were finally under one organization, Metal Valley Ski Touring Association at that time. And a lot of trails were on the forest. As I said earlier, sometimes we kind of ignored the forest and did what we wanted. But as things moved along, we needed to be able to work better with the Forest Service. And luckily, Artis Bynum was involved with the Forest Service at, at that time as a recreation specialist. And I have to say that she was so helpful in developing this trail system. She was the one that figured out how to make it work with the Forest Service. For example, if there was a place where a trail needed to go, but the Forest Service was saying, no, you can't build a brand new trail, she would figure out that maybe historically there was a cow trail there or a horse trail or something so that we could build it. She was the one that figured out how we could get what we needed and still get through the bureaucratic paperwork of the Forest Service. And I'll tell you more about some of the things that artists did in a moment. So as this is going on, 
lots of people dreamed about connecting everything with a trail that goes all the way up and down the valley from the Santa Monica winter. And as work began on that, this is what a map might have looked like with the red line being a possible trail. Of course, what would happen is that you'd come up against the landowner that would say no. So you'd have to scratch out a section and try and put in a new section, back up, how can we make this work? But it was these people that really made it work. Of course, John Hayes on the right, and John was so great at figuring out how to do this stuff and at talking people into it, letting them have us a trail on their property. John Sunderland, of course, is a lawyer and did the same kind of thing and figured out all the legal stuff. And Joy was involved completely in all of this stuff, organizing it and making sure it could all happen. <clears throat> but what was very important with all of this is how the county rules were at that time. The Metal Valley zoning says that you can have a minimum lot size of five, five acres on the valley floor. Well, it turns out that if you have a recreational amenity on your property, you can get greater density points. So if you had, say, 20 acres, you could put more than four houses on it if you had a recreational amenity which could be a trail. So it was these three that really put together and made the Metal Community Trail happen. But we couldn't make it happen without this, the suspension bridge. Now, it just so happens that for a year or two before the bridge was built, we actually put pallets right in the river and crossed the river at this point. Luckily, the very first year the bridge was built, the river was too high and we couldn't have done it anyway. Well, this bridge at the time cost $240,000 to build. It was $240,000 that we did not have. Well, once again, it was John and John and Joy that figured out that the value of the property that the trails crossed was worth that much money. So I have to explain that at that time, you can get grants from the state to build things like this, but they can't go to just anyone or anything. They had to go to some sort of government agency. In this case, it had to go to Okanagan County. So officially, the Metal Valley Community Trail is an Okanagan County park that is managed by Metal Trails. Well, for the funding to be able to occur for a bridge like this, Okanagan County had to have a recreation plan. And that's where Jim Gregg stepped in. Jim came to the Forest Service uh, most likely to help manage Sandy Butte ski area. Of course, that didn't happen, but Jim came from Summit County in Colorado, where he had just finished working on a recreation plan for Summit County. So he took Summit County's recreation plan and along with Jim and John and John and Joy and me, we would go into John Hayes's office, which was one of the few places in the valley back then that actually had a computer. And we metalized the Summit County Recreation Plan and made changes where we needed. We took the plan to the county commissioners. They okayed it. The county then had a recreation plan and then would be eligible for grants to build things like the bridge for the community trail. And of course, our side of it, the matching funds, was the value of the deeded right-of-ways for the Metal Community Trail as it went up and down the valley. So to make that trail happen, we had to have all these things that this cartoon by Bob Cram illustrates. We had to have Okanagan County Public Works, Forest Service, volunteers of all kinds, and all the right-of-way deeds. And that's why we have what we have today. Well, this is Chickadee Trailhead in the early days. When Sun Mountain was being rebuilt by the Haubs, the county required that they rebuild part of the road around the edge of Patterson Lake and up the draw towards Chickadee. To do that, they needed to excavate a lot of dirt, and there was no place to put that dirt. And this is where artist Bynum stepped in once again. We knew that we had to have a better parking lot. Originally, we were just parking cars up near the old flow parking lot and at the top of Sun Mountain. So using the fill dirt from the construction of the road, we went to the Chickadee area where artists got the Forest Service to cut down a bunch of the trees. 
And we put the fill dirt there to make the parking lot and to build this area in front of the Chickadee Day Lodge. Not only that, but at the time, Lone Fir Campground had a bunch of hazard trees that the Forest Service wanted to get rid of. So the Forest Service cut the trees. The trees were then hauled to McMillan's sawmill down south of Carlton, where they were sawed, sawed into boards and the Forest Service donated them to MVSTA. And that's what was used to build the Day Lodge at Chickadee Trail. Well, as you all know, the Nordic team in the Metau Valley has grown. It's one of the biggest in the state, if not the country, with well over 100 kids involved. Um, pretty amazing considering the amount of Olympians that have come out of that with Eric, and Sadie, and now with Novi. It's just, this whole program is absolutely amazing. And it's really started with Linda Kimbrell. Um, Tom and Linda came to the Valley early on. They bought what was still Winter Mountain Sports, turned it into what it is today. Linda was a Spanish teacher at the high school and also had an interest in starting the ski team, which she did. And the first Metal Valley ski team, I think, had three girls on it. Um, and grown to what it is today. She also started the Nordic camp every December. In those days, it was called the Marty Hall camp because she got Marty Hall to come down and start to teach at some of the very first ones. Well, so this is what we've got. This is what we ended up with. This is, of course, most of you know, approaching a suspension bridge near Cum Road as we move down Valley, along towards the trailhead, up to Sun Mountain and View Ridge, and then on into the rendezvous. But what's important is early on, we changed the name of MVSTA from Metal Valley Ski Touring Association to Metal Valley Sport Trail Association, because not only do we now have fat bikes, but it was important that our trails be used year round for hiking, biking, and of course, horses, which were really instrumental in getting a lot of this going because some of the very, very early ski trails, and of course, some of the mountain bike and hiking trails were originally horse trails. But back to us, skiing is our passion. We wanna ski as long into the season as possible to the very, very bitter end. And that is that. Wonderful. <laughs> that was so great. Thank you. Learn something new. Time. Yeah. I'm glad that cow didn't hurt you worse. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty darn surprised. <laughs> oh, and thanks to all those people that had the vision. And it's it's pretty amazing, really, that it all all came together and what it is today. And there is a question here in the chat. Uh, it says, what do you think are the two greatest challenges facing Nordic skiing in Washington state generally over the next five years? Are those the same challenges facing the penthouse? So uh, could you say that one more time? I missed the first part. Yeah, uh, they're just asking about what do you think are the two greatest challenges? And I would think climate change would be one, but. Absolutely, climate change is by far the biggest challenge to figure out how to deal with less snow and Metau Trails is working on that very hard. I don't know if you've all noticed or not, but they've done a lot of work on cutting back the overstory on a lot of trails so more snow can fall on the trails so they can groom with less snow, which I think is really, really important. I have to say that, you know, I've been here for what, 45 years and 1976, was the only year that we didn't have enough snow to ski. And, uh, usually we can make it sometimes limited, you know, maybe just Little Wolf and Thompson at Sun Mountain or the upper rendezvous. The other thing that they're doing is looking at maybe some higher elevation parking lots. So that's the biggest challenge. The second biggest challenge, really, we're seeing it everywhere now, is, is crowding. How are they going to deal with parking lots and toilets. And Tom Perkins, when he came 40 some years ago to advise us, he said, you know what's gonna happen to you guys? 
you're going to have to worry about parking lots and toilets. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's definitely going to, going to be the case. Yeah, interesting. Another question here. Lot, lots of thank yous. Uh, do you remember Chris Dempster? Yes. Is having a role. Okay. So Chris and Chris was married to. Okay. Sorry about that phone. Okay. Chris was married to Scott Demurk at the time, and they were very interested in cross country skiing. And they worked with Dick Hamill for a while, and they had a little ski shop at the Virginian. And trails were groomed right across the street from the Virginian. Um, and Dave Schultz, who was then a county commissioner, also groomed some trails in Twisp down near the Twisp, where the Twisp River and the Metow River come together. So they ran a ski shop there. Scott and Chris, unfortunately, uh, split up. But Chris kept with it. And then for a while, she had a little ski rental shop out of uh, uh, the motel in Twisp. For just a little bit and then uh, sadly she she died when she was very young. I, I think Chris was also on the original organizational documents of the Meadow Valley. Spirit. So. Yeah she was one yeah, of the original board of directors and signed. Yeah. I love seeing all those pictures of you guys when you were you know so buff. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying <laughs> i know i've seen you out there you're still buff jay sure. that's right yes <laughs> yeah wonderful yeah. anybody else want to pin in ask a question here let's see oh there is another question can you read that Don? one more question about the early days do you know anything about the ski trails groomed up on the old schoolhouse site in twisp I think it was the high school PE classes. All I know is that Dave Schultz groomed down near the river um, because he owned Idlewild Motel at that time and was trying to get guests to come in the winter. And so he did a little grooming in that area. And that's it. He may, he may have gone up to where the old school was and groomed a little bit there too. Yeah, and of course they have the Sean McCabe trail there. At the high school. At the high school now, yeah. This is the one in Twist, you know, up on the little bench above the medical center there. Um, because in those days, it was school building and there were, there were no houses up there. Or right. very few. Nice little yeah. bench up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, some people showed some interest in the Hawks. I don't know if you want me to do a little of that or not. Yes, let's do it. Okay. So, lately... I've been using these skis for a lot of skiing all around the Metal. In fact, yesterday I skied Patterson Mountain on my Hawks. Snow was a little funky, but doable because of the single pole. Now, these are the skis that have a skin permanently attached to the middle. And let's see if I can make this work to show you what it's like. Okay, there we go, I think.
Nice. There you go. What kind of boots do you use? Well, originally I just used leather three pin boots, but I have a foot injury right now. So I'm using plastic telemark boots. Hmm. But I've actually used the Hawks with a universal binding that you can use any snow boot as long as you're in powder. But if you're, the skis are so wide that if you're in any kind of hard snow, you need a pretty stiff plastic boot. So I recommend don't mess around, get a plastic boot. As I said yesterday, I, I used those on Patterson Mountain where there was some pretty weird snow, but because of that single pole, um, they were, is, that, is that me making that sound? Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody's unmuted. Let me... Uh, oh, well, anyway. Yeah. Um, so wasn't the, the hawk skiing, isn't that kind of like the original skiing that there was back in the day, <laughs> like hundreds of years ago? Yeah, so many of you know Nils Larsen, and he went to China in, in uh, Altai Mountains, where the local people there made skis, real long skis, and they attached to the bottom horsehair, tip to tail. And they used those for hunting, and of course they used a single pole. And that, that kind of motivated Nils to come up with the hawks, um, even though Carhu had made a similar ski called a sweeper a little before that. He refined it, but they decided to make them really short because a lot of people wanted to use them like sliding snowshoes. And there's a, a Facebook page called the Hawksters that people post their adventures on hawk skis. And a lot of people from the Midwest, places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, where it's relatively flat, are out on their hawks and just flat terrain, just using it like a sliding snowshoe. And that's why they're so short. But we found that with the skin, you can't climb as steeply as an AT ski with skins, but for us old guys, that's okay. We'd rather take a less steep angle as we climb up and then coming down as it goes slower than a normal ski because of the skin, but that's okay. Um, I'm happy to go slower too. Nice. I'm going to get some of those. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Nils was out of them because of the supply chain problems until now, and now he's got a bunch. And I think right. uh, a bunch of places in the Valley sell. Nice. Yay. All right. Anybody else want to say anything? Just, yeah. Thank you all. Yay. In here. And thank you, Don, so much. That was nice to see you all. Thank you, Don. All right. Enjoy this beautiful thank day. You. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to make one comment, if I could, before you sign off. Don, thank you so much for providing the history of the valley and the people who are important to creating the trail system. I think what you've done is a model that ought to be done for the Metal Conservancy, for Room One, for Metal Arts, for every other organization that's really significant, the Confluence Gallery in our valley, because there are so many people who don't get any credit. People are coming in in droves today who do not know who the key people were who did things to create the valley that we have today. It didn't just happen. It happened because people put in amazing hours of volunteer time, creativity, ingenuity, resourcefulness, uh, beating things up with, with uh, windshields, with, uh, with tools. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's quite a story. And I'd like to see that done by, for every single organization. And so this was a model. I really appreciate it, Don. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank I you. Do it. <laughs>